All right, welcome everyone to today's deep dive. We're tackling a uh, pretty technical veterinary surgical paper today. Yeah, definitely. Buckle up. So if you're like uh, prepping for a continuing education course, or maybe just like a total surgery nerd. Yeah, love those. Get ready for some serious insights. Yes. <laughs> Get those thinking caps on, everybody. Um, we're diving into a study that caught my eye because it focuses on this rare complication after a super common orthopedic surgery in dogs. You're talking about the TPLO. Right, PPLO, exactly. Hot low procedure. So for our listeners who, you know, maybe they're not as familiar. Sure. Could you give us like the quick and dirty, like what is this surgery? Absolutely. So TPLO, it stands for tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. Wow, mouthful. Yeah, it's a mouthful, but basically it's the the gold standard for stabilizing the knee joint okay. in dogs who have ruptured their cranial cruciate ligament. So like the ACL in us humans. Exactly, exactly. Think of it like a dog ACL tear. Ouch. Yeah, ouch is right. So it's a pretty it's a pretty involved surgery. Oh yeah, very complex. It involves like a cut in the tibia, which is the shin bone. Right, and then you have to rotate a portion of it yeah. to change the angle of the joint. Whoa, wow. it's it's a big deal. Okay, so we've got this common surgery. Right. But this paper is all about like a rare. Very rare. And serious complication. Yes, permanent fibular nerve injury. Like whoop. Yeah, no, it's crazy, right? It's definitely unusual, which is why the study is so interesting. So unusual. Uh-huh. Okay, so let's dive into the specifics. Okay. Like, what kind of symptoms did these dogs actually have? All right, so all three dogs in this study, okay. they developed these similar neurological symptoms after surgery. Like neurological meaning? Well, they had a very specific type of lameness mm. and inability to flex their hock, so that's the ankle. Okay. And they even had muscle wasting in the lower leg. So not just a limp. No, not just any limp. It's a very particular yeah. way of moving. Or or not moving. Right. Exactly. A lack of movement. Whoa. And get this, one of the dogs actually had electrodiagnostic testing. Whoa, fancy. Yeah, to confirm the nerve damage. Like an EMG? Yep, like an EMG. Wow. So pretty high tech stuff. Okay, so before we get into like the why of all of this, remind us, like, why do these symptoms point to the fibular nerve? Oh, that's a great question. So the fibular nerve is kind of a big deal in the lower leg. Oh. It controls the muscles that lift the paw and it provides sensation to the top of the foot. Hmm. So when it's damaged, you get these problems with, with lifting the paw and flexing that ankle. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so the symptoms all make sense. Right. But here's where I think it gets super interesting. Okay. The researchers noticed something really interesting on the on the x-rays, the post-op x-rays. Yeah, yeah. Of all three dogs. All three dogs had a drill hole in a very specific location on the back of the tibia, just below the TPLO plate. Wait, a drill hole? Mm-hmm. Like that's the smoking gun? They think so, yeah. Uh, yeah. They use these 3D anatomical model, which um, you can actually see in figure two of the paper. Okay. And it shows how a drill bit going through this exact spot could actually hit the fibular nerve. Whoa, that's wild. It really is. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to picture this in my head. Yeah. So are they saying that the surgeon's messed up? Well, not necessarily messed up. Okay. But maybe a series of, of little decisions that added up. Okay. They think that maybe the surgeons initially put the plate a little too far back on the tibia, okay. drilled the hole, and then, get this, adjusted the plate forward. Oh. Leaving that original drill hole. Oh, my God. Right, where it could cause trouble. So, like a domino effect. Exactly. Like one tiny miscalculation in the beginning yeah. can lead to this nerve damage later on. Wow, that's crazy. And you know what else is crazy? What? The paper mentioned that the owners didn't even notice the way the dogs were walking, like the abnormality. Really? It was only the vets during the checkups that noticed it. Oh, my goodness. So, it really emphasizes how important those post-op exams are. Yeah, wow, so those subtle signs. Exactly, vets need to be super vigilant looking for any signs of nerve damage during those follow-ups. Right, because early detection is key. Absolutely. For any vets listening, pay attention to those post-TPLO exams. Yes, please. Okay, so we've laid the groundwork, common surgery, rare complication, and a potential culprit in the shadows. 
I like it. I love these deep dives, you know, because you start connecting the dots and you see how these seemingly small details yeah. can have major implications. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, stay tuned, everyone, because this deep dive is about to get even more interesting. Oh, yeah, we're just getting started. Welcome back to our deep dive, everybody. We're getting into fibular nerve injury after TPLO surgery. It's kind of crazy how a little drill hole can make such a big difference for these dogs. I know, right? And before we like really get into these three cases, yeah. I think it helps to picture what we're even talking about. Right. Like, let's look closer at the figular nerve itself. Yeah, let's get visual. Where exactly is this nerve and why is it so vulnerable during a TPLO? So the fibular nerve branches off the sciatic nerve, which is like the biggest nerve in the body. Whoa. Okay. And it goes down the back of the leg, passing super close to the tibia, that shin bone we talked about. Right, right. So it's right there in the surgical field. Yeah. No wonder it's at risk. Exactly. And to make things even more complicated, the fibular nerve splits into two branches just below the knee. Wait, so there's two? Two branches, yep. The superficial fibular nerve and the deep fibular nerve. Oh my gosh, so it's not just one nerve to worry about, it's two. It's a lot to think about and it takes a lot of precision. Yeah. And in these three cases, the researchers think both branches were probably affected just based on the symptoms. That makes sense. I remember the paper mentioned those 3D models they used oh, yeah. to show how that drill hole could cause the damage. Uh-huh. They were really detailed. What did they show? They showed the exact path of the fibular nerve, like compared to the bones and muscles. And you can see clearly how a drill going through that spot on the back of the tibia right. could totally hit the nerve, especially if the plate was a little too far back at first. I wish we could show our listeners these models. Me too. They were so cool. The researchers even like simulated the drill path really? compared to the nerve. And it's it's scary how easy it would be to damage it. Wow, impressive detective work. It really shows how important it is to know the anatomy. Yeah. And to think about all the risks during surgery. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about the long-term effects of this kind of nerve damage. Yes, good point. What does this mean for the dog's life? Like, is it a small problem or a big one? Well, it can be pretty serious. Oh, no. The most obvious thing is that the dog will have trouble walking. Right. They might lift their leg really high or even drag their paw. Oh. Which can cause other problems like arthritis or injuries in other joints. And then they can't feel their paw properly, right? Exactly, which is a big worry because then they might hurt themselves more easily. Like step on something sharp and not even know it. It's so sad to think these dogs could have these problems for their whole lives. I know. And it could have been avoided. It really makes you think. Yes. So what could owners do to make sure their dogs are getting the best care after a TPLO? What should they look for? The most important thing is to go to all the follow-up appointments Okay. and pay attention to your dog. Mm -hmm. If you see any changes in how they walk or stand or act, yeah. tell your vet right away. And it's okay to ask questions, right? Of course. Something seems off, don't be afraid to say something. That's good to know. So from the surgical side, how can vets prevent this nerve injury from happening in the first place? That's the big question, right? Yeah. The researchers really emphasized careful technique, okay. especially with drilling and putting in screws. Makes sense. They said to be extra careful finding the exact location of the fibular nerve before drilling anything. Yeah. They said using anatomical landmarks or even imaging during surgery could help. I imagine that's hard. The nerve is so tiny. It is, but some vets are using nerve monitoring now. What's that? It uses electrical stimulation to find and protect the nerve during surgery. Oh, wow. So it's like an extra set of eyes? Exactly. And they also said that if a surgeon has to move the plate during surgery, yeah. they should always drill a new hole, not use an old one that might be in the wrong spot now. That makes sense. It might take a little longer, but it could save the dog a lot of trouble. Exactly. And this isn't just for TPLOs. This applies to any surgery with bones and nerves. So it's a good lesson for all surgeons, not just TPLO surgeons. Right. Being aware, being precise, and really respecting the anatomy is key to minimizing risks. For the best outcome for our patients. Exactly. Okay, so we've talked about anatomy, the effects of nerve damage, and ways to prevent it. Yeah, it feels like a good time to talk about those three cases from the study. Yes, let's look at each one and see what we can learn. Okay. So case number one was a nine-year-old female English Springer Spaniel okay. who had a right hind limb TPLO. About six weeks later, she starts showing those classic signs, like the lameness, the knuckling, the muscle loss. So... Pretty obvious signs. Yeah, pretty clear cut. Did they do any other tests? Oh, that's a good question. 
Surprisingly, no. They tried some conservative treatments, like electrical stimulation and anti-inflammatory meds. Okay. But nothing worked. She kept having those problems. It makes you wonder, what if they'd caught it sooner? Yeah, it does. It brings up some important questions about early detection. Definitely. Okay, what about case number two? This one was a seven-year-old male Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Okay, and what were his signs like? His were a little more subtle. Okay. He was also lame, but the vet said he kind of flicked his leg forward more than the other side. Interesting. So not as obvious as the knuckling. Right, maybe harder to diagnose. Did they do any special tests? No, then they. Not at first, but six months later, a neuro exam showed he had muscle loss. In a specific muscle? Yeah, in his right cranial tibial muscle. That makes sense, given what we know about the fibular nerve. Exactly. And they also found he had osteoarthritis in his right stifle joint, which is pretty common after cruciate injuries. Wow, poor guy. Okay, what about case three? Anything different about that one? Case three was interesting because it was a three-year-old female American bulldog cross. Okay. And she had TPLOs on both hind legs. Wow, both legs. Yep, bilateral TPLOs. Did she have nerve problems on both sides? Nope, just the right. And this time, they used electrodiagnostic testing to confirm the damage. Ah, okay, now we're getting fancy. Can you explain what that is and what they found? Sure, so they used EMG, which measures the electrical activity in muscles. Mm. And it showed abnormal activity in the cranial tibial muscle on the right side, mm. meaning nerve damage. They also did something called motor electroneurography. What's that? It measures the speed and strength of electrical signals going along the nerve. Interesting. And the results showed a much weaker signal when they stimulated the nerve below the knee. Oh, wow. So that confirmed damage to both branches of the fibular nerve. So they had all the proof they needed. Yep. All three cases, different breeds, different severities, but all linked by that drill hole. And the fibular nerve. Right. It really shows that even common surgeries can have rare complications. For sure. And while this study makes us think about a lot of things, yeah. it also gives us valuable info to improve how we do surgery and how we care for patients. I agree. In the last part of our deep dive, we'll talk about some of those bigger questions. Ooh, I like it. This is where it gets really interesting. Stay tuned, folks. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everyone, for the last part of our deep dive. This fibular nerve injury thing has been quite a journey. It really has. We started with this little drill hole, and now we're talking about all these complicated anatomical things. Yeah, exactly. And as we've been talking about these cases, I keep wondering, like, how often does this really happen? Is it actually this rare, or are we just not seeing it? That's the million-dollar question, right? The researchers themselves say it might be happening more than we think. Really? Yeah, because the signs can be subtle, and owners might not notice right away how their dog is walking. So dogs could have this nerve damage, and nobody knows. It's possible, which is why those post-op exams are so important. Yeah, we got to be really careful, even if the dog seems fine. Absolutely. Look for those little clues. This whole discussion makes me think about something else. What's that? If a dog ends up with permanent nerve damage after a TPLO, can we really say the surgery was successful? Hmm. That's a tough one. It is, right. We're trying to help them move better, but there are always risks, even if they're small. And it's so important for owners to understand all the risks, even the rare ones, before they agree to surgery. Totally agree. Being open and honest with pet owners is crucial. This whole deep dive has really shown me how complex surgery is and how important it is to be precise. It's true. Every little thing matters. And this study was just about one specific problem with one specific surgery. Exactly. But the lessons we've learned about technique, anatomy, and checking up on patients apply to all kinds of surgery. That's a good point. I'm curious, what other research is being done on this? Are there any new ways to prevent or even treat this nerve injury? There's a lot of cool stuff happening, like computer-assisted surgery. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. It's getting more and more advanced, which could help make these surgeries more accurate and safer. That's amazing. Yeah. What about those regenerative therapies, like stem cells? Could those help with nerve regeneration? People are definitely looking into that. Wow. It's still early, but there's hope that these therapies could help treat or even reverse nerve damage. That would be incredible. It's uh, amazing how veterinary medicine keeps finding new ways to help animals. I know. It's inspiring. And as we learn more, we can hopefully prevent things like fibular nerve injury and make sure every dog lives a happy, healthy uh, life. Well said. Yeah. This deep dive has been packed with information. It has. We talked about anatomy, surgery, risks, ethics, and even the future of research. It's been great talking about all this with you. 
likewise. And to all our listeners, thanks for joining us on this journey into veterinary surgery. Remember, knowledge is power when it comes to our furry friends. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds inspired, hearts light, and tails wagging.